Hi, I'm Matt, and I'm about to go camp in an alien hotspot. I'm not enjoying myself here anymore. Hi, I'm Matt, and I'm about to go camp in an alien hotspot. The obvious follow-up would be, why? The answer is far more emotional than you might expect, and we'll get there, but first, let's run down the plan. Number one, make a pilgrimage to Giant Rock in the Lander's Desert. This place is weird. For decades and decades, it's been a UFO hotspot, and it's also the site for many, many other interesting things. Number two, make it to the campsite. Number three, utilizing a telescope, see the stars and planets up close. Personal victory for me would be getting a beautiful seal of the moon, so let's add that to the list. And finally, camp under the stars, thus finding unity with the universe. You know, it'd also be pretty cool if I saw a UFO, so let's add that to the list. Anyway, I know it's a lot to ask, and I'm late, so let's get going. For decades and decades, Joshua Tree, California and the surrounding areas have been a very popular place for UFO enthusiasts. If you believe the hype, JT as I assume the locals call it, is not only a great place to experience a UFO sighting, according to local history, it might be just the place to see a UFO landing. Each year, Joshua Tree is home to many interstellar outings and was for several years home to an annual UFO conference, the self-proclaimed Woodstock of UFOs. My first stop is a pilgrimage to Giant Rock in nearby Landers. Located in the Mojave Desert, Giant Rock has been called the largest freestanding boulder in the world. The boulder is about seven stories tall and covers nearly 6,000 square feet. The site has held spiritual significance to Native American peoples for thousands of years, often used for ceremonies and sometimes associated with prophecies. In the 1930s, a man named Frank Kritzer decided to settle in, or squat, on the unused government land, making a home literally under the rock. A German immigrant and a miner, Kritzer used mining equipment to dig out a 400 square foot home for himself beneath the rock. Kritzer would install a large radio antenna above the rock as well. The combination of his German origin, the radio antenna, and World War II reaching its peak caused rumors to swirl that he was in fact a German spy, a claim that might have resulted in his death. Kritzer would be killed in an explosion underneath the rock. While the exact cause of the explosion is unknown, it's believed that authorities were trying to remove Kritzer and accidentally ignited some mining explosives while using tear gas. This is honestly super and in, in insanely cool. The only bummer about it is kind of just what humans have done to it, but you know, that's what people do. After Kritzer's death, his friend George Van Tassel, a pilot and aviation tradesman, decided to live at the site and in 1947 purchased the land from the government and moved himself and his family there permanently. Van Tassel was a bit of a mysterious and quirky figure as well and became a UFO expert, a new age philosopher and the leader of his own religion. In a 1952 book, I Rode a Flying Saucer, he describes meeting with very tan extraterrestrials, which he claimed transmitted information to him telepathically. The stillness here is kind of alarming. I, I can I kind of understand how if you were out here by yourself and you kind of chose to make your way all the way out here alone and then you lived under the rock, I think maybe um, if aliens weren't coming, you'd hope that they would just for the company. And thinking on that stillness and the solitude, it kind of makes me a little bit nervous for this evening. Um, because while I will be alone as well there, uh, the sun won't be out. While leaving Giant Rock, one can spot George Van Tassel's lasting legacy, the Integratron, just a few miles down the road. According to his book, the alien leader gave him instructions to build a machine that had the power to strengthen and heal humans. George would spend years throwing UFO conventions at Giant Rock in order to fund the Integratron, but it would never be complete. By the end of his life, it had been built out to be a two-story high white dome that still stands today. Now, I was originally gonna go camping in the alien desert, like I said, uh, but I remembered I don't really know how to camp, and it's kind of dangerous to do that by yourself, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so I got BuzzFeed to pay for a really nice Airbnb. However, there is a tent on the property. So I'm going to make good on that promise. And I'm gonna stay the night in a tent under the stars 
after I've seen them nice and up close. I also really, 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 really wanted to get to the house before sunset. And um, it's not going to happen. So I'm a little bothered by that. Okay, we're at the house. It's a pretty cool house. I thought it was gonna be a little spooky, um, but it's not, it's fine. Got here way later than I wanted to, but I also wanted to see the dinosaurs, and I did that. So um, check that off the list of things that I wanted to achieve on this trip. Getting a cool picture of the moon with a telescope is a, another one of them. I'm gonna go figure out how to use this telescope. I'm told that it's not very easy to do, and I'm also told that you should do it in the daytime. I've come prepared. Just kidding. If I came prepared, I would have looked this up five days ago. As both my energy level and the hours waned, I found myself not only wondering how to put together the telescope, but why I was even doing it in the first place. An answer that I promised you earlier in the video and an answer that I wouldn't fully understand until long after I came back from the desert. So I've been sitting on this footage for a while now. I've been trying to figure out what exactly happened in the desert, but more importantly, like I said, why I went there in the first place. I thought that I went to make a fun little video, uh, but it so quickly became not that. And I think that the answer to why lies in September 2019. When we traveled to the Area 51 raid, we pulled off to the side of the road and for a few minutes we stood in the dark under the stars. It didn't make the video and it seemed irrelevant to everyone else, but I've never felt anything like that before or since. That was an incredible experience. Whether it was the idea of alien life or just being surrounded by like-minded people, there was something that said, Matt, you are not alone. I was feeling optimistic for my place in the world and hopeful for what was on the horizon in the future. Obviously, we now know what was on the horizon. And I've never felt more alone in my entire life. The isolation, the time in my head, the time on Twitter, every single ounce of positivity that I had gained from that trip to the desert was replaced by some of the most negative energy I've ever experienced. I, like many other people, became hyper-focused on how poorly we're treating each other here. And I started to think that if we aren't alone, maybe we should be. So maybe I found myself in the desert once again, attempting to see something I've never seen before. Or maybe I was trying to recapture something I once had. After a few hours, I did manage to find the moon in the telescope. But in pulling my head out of the telescope, the darkness and the wind were an immediate reminder of how alone I was. It's getting windy, it's getting cold. The stillness and the um, wind are combining to make a weird energy. I'm starting to get unnerved by. Um, I've changed because I was cold and um, that was making me not feel good. And I think that when you don't feel good, you don't think good. So I try to change that. I still don't feel great though. 
I really wanted to I really wanted to um, sleep under the stars but there's a I'm not enjoying myself here anymore. I made a mistake with my brain, letting it go. Coming from this area. And I didn't like it. Oh! Oh, hello, guy. I've, I've elected not to try and sleep under the stars, like I said I was going to. Not because I can't, but because I don't want to. After returning home, I spent a few days reflecting on what I could only categorize as a failure. I didn't sleep under the stars, I didn't see anything otherworldly, and not for a second did I even appreciate the solitude. Every bump or creak or rustle was just fuel for my very anxious mind and a sobering reminder of how secluded I was. And then it dawned on me. I never had a chance of recapturing a feeling I had experienced in 2019 because I'm not that person anymore. I, like probably you and so many others, have changed so drastically in the last 16 months. Honestly, I think my preoccupation with life out there has taken a lot of attention away from what's down here. The people. This last year has shown us every way we can let each other down, but it has also shown us many ways that we can lift each other up. And perhaps the search for alien life is not something you can or should do by yourself. I went out to answer the question, are we alone? And in doing so, made sure that I was. If I've learned one thing from this trip or the pandemic, it's, it's that my passion for life out there does not come from a disdain for life down here. It comes from the desire to share and understand life with others. Maybe that's aliens. But more than likely, it's with other humans. Also, I did take some photos that night. The wind picked up and made me kind of freak out a little bit, and then I completely forgot about them. So I didn't take a look at them until I got back, but I think I did a pretty good job. Mm -hmm.